Insulin resistance is such a hot topic and for good reason because it can lead to severe metabolic dysfunction, severe diseases including type 2 diabetes and the hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance has been correlated or associated with cancer, dementia, heart disease, early mortality, so many other disease processes that it makes sense that we need to pay attention to insulin resistance and take it seriously. But here's what's so interesting. There's there's sort of a form, quote unquote, of insulin resistance uh, that occurs for people eating low carb diets or fasting. And so there's a little bit of a debate if people are saying, well, look, you think you're doing a great thing by following a low carb or keto diet or intermittent fasting, and you're improving your metabolic health, but you now show signs of insulin resistance, and that's a problem. You need to be worried about that. I don't think that's true. I've been promoting that that's not the truth and that we don't have to worry about that because there are two different processes, insulin resistance with high insulin and this quote unquote insulin resistance with low insulin. Well, now we have evidence showing that that is indeed the case. And I'm Dr. Brett Scher, the medical director at dietdoctor.com. And I really want to talk about this study because it helps, um, it, it helps bring to light how we have to know more of the details. Insulin resistance is a, is a you know, umbrella grab bag term. But what we really need to know is what is the process going on causing the insulin, insulin resistance? And again, insulin resistance with high insulin levels is one thing. Insulin resistance with low insulin levels, something completely different. We have to stop calling that insulin resistance. And here's the study. The impact of prolonged fasting on insulin secretion, insulin action, and hepatic versus whole body insulin secretion disposition indices in healthy young males. Okay, that's a mouthful. But let's talk about what all that means. So first, healthy young males, right? We got to preface that, that this study had 13 healthy white males from ages 23 to 26 years old. It was a Danish study. And what they did, they had them, first they provided all the meals for three days leading up to the study, then a 36 hour fast, then blood draws and tests. Then they had in between eight and 16 weeks of just time off. Then they came back, three days of all meals being supplied and then a 12 hour fast with the same blood test. And then what they wanted to see was what was the difference in glucose and insulin, but also hepatic versus whole body insulin secretion disposition indices. Now that's a term I hadn't heard of before, insulin secretion disposition indices, but basically they're talking about insulin sensitivity, right? They're basically talking about how sensitive are you um, in your liver versus the whole body. So for after the 36 hour fast, 100% of the, of the subjects improved their hepatic insulin action. They improved their hepatic insulin sensitivity. They lowered their overall insulin, they lowered their hepatic glucose output, and they improved their insulin sensitivity in their liver. I'm pointing here because this is where your liver is. But for their whole body, their whole body insulin sensitivity actually went down a little bit. But when you take it as the whole picture with the, with the liver improving, the glucose and insulin for the whole body going down. And then these indices of insulin secretion disposition indices changing towards quote unquote insulin resistance in the whole body. When you look at that whole picture though, it's a clear improvement, right? It's a clear benefit. So one of their hypotheses for the way they interpreted this was it was a form of beta cell rest. The beta cell in your pancreas is resting because your body is so insulin sensitive. It's like your pancreas knows it doesn't need um, to crank out so much insulin. And when I say your body, I actually meant your liver, right? When your liver is that insulin sensitive, your pancreas responds to your liver first. And so it realizes it can back off on the insulin production. But we, so we know, you know, if someone's following a keto diet or if someone's doing a prolonged fast and then has a carb load, they're going to respond in a way that makes them look insulin resistant or pre-diabetic. And that's a surprise but this could be why, and this mo actually most likely is why. And actually Ben Bickman uh, went on Twitter to say, stop calling it physiologic insulin resistance because it's not insulin resistance. We shouldn't use that term. Instead, we should say improved hepatic insulin sensitivity because that's the focus. That's the key. Now, we don't know if this is the same in patients who are obese or already having some sort of metabolic dysfunction. We don't know how they would respond differently, but it makes sense that you want to improve hepatic insulin sensitivity, you want to improve hepatic glucose output and decrease it, and that that is the primary focus. And if the pancreas is responding to that, that is a good thing. So other terms have been used for this, like adaptive glucose sparing, um, that you're sort of saving the glucose for your brain 
as your body's running on ketones. But, you know, there's only a 36 hour fast. It's not like it was uh, months and months of a ketogenic diet or a five day fast or something. This was after just 36 hours. So pretty impressive results that it happened that quickly. And so you, you could extrapolate that if you're on a long-term ketogenic diet, the same is going to happen. And, but the key is overall, the glucose went down, the insulin went down. That's what you want when you're trying to treat metabolic disease. So I thought this was very helpful to help us realize that you can't talk about insulin resistance as one thing when different parts of the body respond differently. And while we're on the topic of insulin and insulin resistance, there was another paper that just came out talking about brain insulin sensitivity. So this paper was titled, Brain Insulin Signaling in Metabolic Homeostasis and Disease. And basically this was a review looking at the data out there to support the concept that brain insulin resistance likely happens before body insulin resistance. And now we're talking about true insulin resistance, both the hepatic and whole body insulin resistance with hyperinsulinemia, with high insulin levels. And what they're hypothesizing is the brain controls a lot of the body's responses and it's the brain insulin resistance that happens first. So they go through the process showing how insulin crosses the blood brain barrier to get from our blood into our brain and that there are receptors in the brain, insulin receptors, just like there are in the rest of the body. And that those receptors can become less responsive to insulin as the insulin concentration gets higher. And that then has a downstream effect on controlling appetite, being able to break down your fat cells and the fat and triglycerides in your liver. And so what they're proposing is what they call overnutrition or caloric excess induces brain insulin resistance even before peripheral insulin signaling is impaired. Basically saying it all starts in the brain. Now, this is where they lose me a little bit because of course they say pharmacologic interventions to improve brain insulin signaling have therapeutic potential for metabolic disease, diabetes, a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Well, we know what else can improve insulin resistance and likely brain insulin signaling and improves metabolic disease, diabetes, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Improved lifestyle, right? Low carb nutrition being a big part of it, whether that's keto or not, just reducing the carbs, likely increasing the protein, re naturally reducing your calories, ins reducing your glucose, improving your insulin sensitivity in your liver being the most important part like we covered in the previous part of this video that that has a dramatic impact. So rather than going straight to talking about pharmacologic interventions, they need to talk about the lifestyle interventions that are effective, preventive and treatment. And we have so much information on our website at dietdoctor.com about treating fatty liver disease, about treating metabolic disease and type two diabetes. The connection with the brain also brings up this whole concept of quote unquote type three diabetes, right? Uh, Alzheimer's disease has been labeled by some as type three diabetes as a, as a dysfunction of glucose utilization and possibly insulin signaling and insulin resistance in the brain. So it's really bringing this all together. But here's the thing, if you use a drug to treat one part, you're probably not treating another part, but what treats it all most likely? Lifestyle, nutrition, moving your body, stress management, getting adequate sleep, things that don't cost a lot, right? They, some might find them hard to do. And that's what we wanna do here at Diet Doctors, make them easier for you to learn about and implement into your lifestyle and connect you with physicians and clinicians and coaches who can help you on your path to make those changes because those are likely going to be more impactful than any drug, uh, any expensive drug with side effects or any drug that's focused on one part because nutrition hits it all. So I thought these, these were very interesting studies on insulin. Time to stop talking about insulin resistance in the setting of of low carb and fasting and instead talk about hepatic insulin sensitivity and also understanding that the brain plays a role, but lifestyle improves the brain just as much as it does the liver and, the, and your whole body when it comes to insulin sensitivity, uh, decreasing glucose and decreasing insulin. All right. Anyway, I hope this was helpful um, on your path to achieving metabolic health. If it was, click the thumbs up and the subscribe down below and you'll get all our updates here on Diet Doctor News on YouTube.